feel like I have home field advantage coming back to the LP in New York. So I lived here for uh, five years and moved out to the Bay Area uh, in part to try something new, but in part when my focus changed pretty much exclusively to machine intelligence, there was just a lot happening out there. So sometimes you got to chase it. So I was sitting here thinking, you know, Amir did a really good job of explaining data analytics under the guise of beer. And so I was like, gosh, can I do the same thing with machine intelligence? And I have really bad news. I got nothing. So we're going to have to go with whatever I've got. So quick intro on me uh, and Bloomberg Beta. So Bloomberg Beta is an early stage venture capital fund. So we focus on seed stage investments that are transforming the future of work. And so as you can expect, machine intelligence and the future of work have a fairly high overlap. So about a third of our portfolio is invested in this space. Just to give a bit of context, so Matt mentioned a report that, that I had put out. I put one out in December, and that was the second of its kind. The first came a year before. And the question was, you know, really why focus on machine intelligence? And it actually dates back to some of the work we did together, Matt, um, back at Bloomberg, where we were documenting out the big data landscape. And one of the things I realized as I was investing is we made a lot of big data investments, but instead of investing in where sort of the data was being stored and processed, I, I realized a lot of what I was working on was not the world that was the, the technologies that were making the world bigger, but the technologies that were making the world smaller again and presenting the insights you needed at a given moment. And the ways people were doing that were via learning algorithms, hence, you know, focusing on machine intelligence. Does the clicker work? Come on. There we go. So who's seen this bad boy? Oh, wow, not bad. So this is an attempt to document out. Yes, you've seen it. Thank you for reading it, Matt. <laughs> um, so this is an, uh, an attempt to document out the entire machine intelligence landscape. And actually, we've only got about 10% of what's going on here. So as much as this seems like complete visual overload, oh my gosh, there's so much going on, this is actually just a fraction of what's happening. And did anyone get to see the chart that came out a year prior? Awesome. Uh, so the major difference here, and I'll highlight it a bit later, is that top row wasn't there. So certainly some companies were working on things, but we didn't, we didn't have enough activity to constitute what I'm calling agents or bots and autonomous systems. So what we've really seen in the last year has been this movement away from these spot solutions to, you know, whether they're in the virtual world or the physical world, these systems that are much more conversational, they're much more dynamic, they can make decisions in real time given different inputs, and they feel a lot more human in a lot of cases as well. So what I wanted to do today is just touch on a few things. So obviously what's happening in the last year and what we're excited about in the coming year. The second piece that you know, people have been asking me about more than anything else is you know, what makes for an investable machine intelligence company? And you know, instead of doing that sort of at high level platitudes, what I'll do is I'll take you through a few of our individual investments. I'm not necessarily to talk about the companies themselves, but just sort of those more subtle lenses that we use to say, hey, you know what? This is a spark that made us say we want to jump in here. And of course, who doesn't want to end on the future? So we'll look at that as well. So jumping right into it, if the clicker works, come on. There we go. So with agents, basically what we're talking about is bots. So does everybody, has everyone encountered a bot at one time or another, seen the movie Her? Awesome. So we, <laughs> so we all know what we're talking about. Um, I will admit I haven't said I love you to a bot yet, but I'm excited for the day where I can. Um, and so what's, what's happening here? So there's been this complete explosion of activity, even in the last month since this chart was published, of bots coming, bots coming to the world. And so why is this happening? One way to think about it is it's very similar to what we saw with the mobile app revolution, where putting these together and running experiments is very cheap. Plat, uh, plat, uh, sorry, platforms like Slack and Kick and we'll see what happens with Facebook, are really encouraging developers to come on and build these bots because they think it's going to make their platform stickier. What we see essentially in this ecosystem is we see the big players, people who have a lot of data on you. So think you know, Google, Apple. Um, they're trying to build the closest thing we've got to these general intelligence systems. So they've got all this contextual data for you. They want to be there all the time, sort of being that um, that constant reminder of all the things you need to do in your life and kind of package it all together, find what you need. And as you might ex expect with startups, what we're seeing is them focusing on specific business problems uh, that can provide immediate value to a consumer. And so the thing that's been most interesting here is we are so nascent in this bot ecosystem, yet we're seeing very defined flavors and, and personalities of these bots. And since this is the most exciting area for me, I wanted to just jump into the individual areas for a second. And so first we have cyborgs. So these are kind of the ones that have lasted the longest. Um, what a cyborg essentially is, 
Is this an agent, whether or not you're speaking to it via text, via voice, or via email, that is pur purposely ambiguous as to whether it's a human or an algorithm? So you often don't know, you know, in, in the cases of schedules, schedulers, you're going to CC someone in an email. You're going to say, hey, complete this task, schedule this meeting. They're going to do it for you. Sometimes it's going to be an algorithm that does it. Sometimes it's going to be a human. You don't know. And so the reason these cyborgs are interesting is because the people who are building them are solving problems that are a little bit beyond what algorithms can do right now. So this is their way of gathering a training data set and hopefully moving um, in between that sort of human to algorithmic continuum and hopefully doing it pretty quickly. And so we're seeing these pop up again in tasks like scheduling. Uh, one of the more interesting applications that we've seen recently is their use for elderly care, which I, is an area that's kind of near and dear to my heart. So I hope we see more of that. So next is the synthesizers. And you might be thinking of 80s pop, but I promise this is a different kind of synthesizer. Um, and it's essentially, uh, we, we call this white collar AI. So these bots are doing the job of often what an undergrad coming out of you know, a four-year program will come into a company to do for their first job. And that's essentially take in large, large, large amounts of information, figure out what's relevant, condense it, and pre present some early recommendations. And so we're seeing bots do this. Uh, bots do this in very early days. We've probably only seen six or seven of them pop up so far, but we expect to see more. The next bit is the coordinators. So I haven't had that many experiences with project management in my life so far, but the thing that's always bugged me the most about it is just the fact that you have to be a constant pest. Like, hey, Matt, have you done your work yet? Gary, have you done your work yet? Do you need help? Who needs what? Let's coordinate all these pieces. Um, it's kind of annoying, and it's a job that humans don't necessarily need to do. So one of the things we've seen pop up, especially since platforms like Slack, which are for workplace communication, um, are really advocating for these bots to be on the platform, is a lot of these bots that are doing a lot of professional, uh, essentially, coordination. On the bottom row, we've got the transactors. So these guys are the ones that are going to help you complete all of your e-commerce transactions that you don't want to do. So if it's a cute pair of red shoes, maybe. But if it's you know diapers or toilet paper, I, don't, I just want the lowest price. Please go do it for me. Uh, so we're seeing, essentially, these transactors act as agents on our behalf online. The companions are a really interesting one to me. So another word for them is empathy bots. And you know, when we think of bots, we think of something that's super inhuman. But what we're actually seeing is evidence that they can provide us with emotional support at critical times. And so one example of this is Microsoft deployed a bot in Asia called Zhao Ice. And you know, Zhao Ice is this text bot that speaks as if it were a human. And they've got a bunch of instances. So I, I told you I hadn't said I love you to a bot yet. That's not true for a lot of people who've had an encounter with Zhao Ice and maybe me when I finally do as well. But um, essentially, a lot of people do say, I love you to the bot. They know it's a bot, but they say, hey, you know what? When I was going through that tough time, you're the only one who listened to me. You're the only one who asked me questions about how I was feeling. So you can think about this is great for people going through depressed periods or maybe children who are socially isolated or the elderly who just don't get enough attention. And then we've got Dr. House over here, who's a diagnostician. And the really curious thing about the diagnosticians is they're actually superhuman in a lot of ways um, in, in the specific tasks that they're doing. So we're seeing early examples of this for uh, monitoring and diagnosing dementia and PTSD. And basically what these algorithms do is they can detect subtle signals, either in your voice or using compu computer vision to measure your smile length and how happy you actually are. They're actually doing a much better job than psychologists are in early tests, which is very, very cool. And so giving you one quick example of you know, when to invest in agents and why, and again, I'm just sharing our lenses. Well, you know, it takes seven to 10 years in venture to figure out whether you're right or not. But you know, the, these, are, these are the ways we think about things, and hopefully they'll be helpful to you. So one of the really cool things about this is an example of a, a synthesizer is essentially you're democratizing access to something like an analyst, right? So who gets analysts? Essentially, you know, the C-suite executives of, of any, any company, maybe the heads of business units. Um, and you know, I get a little bit jealous of that because I love research and I want something to 80-20 things for me. So the way these work essentially is, let's say I want to read up on a new topic like, I've heard adversarial learning is really hot. I could print out 500 pages of documents and go through them, or I could tell the bot to do it for me first. Tell me exactly what it thinks it's interesting about adversarial learning. Tell me whether the papers that I've actually printed out are the right ones to read. And if not, it can recommend other things to me. And the one sort of critical point that's slightly less obvious here is this product actually allows me to be a lot more human about the way I research. It's very inefficient to just plow through those 500 pages. 
Whereas if I can have something give me enough information to at least formulate a hypothesis, I can immediately go in and as I'm reading, test that hypothesis and look for areas that you know, maybe I hadn't thought about before. So the one thing we actually do as a fund we always try to think about is for every investment we make, we kind of think in our own heads, in five years it will be crazy not to use this product and if we can't formulate a statement for that, then we just don't make the investment. So what's next? So autonomous systems, um, what's happening? Honestly, it's pandemonium, stuff's crazy. This is probably the area you guys have heard the most about. So you've got basically the self-driving car wars, you've got the tech giants like Google, you've got the rideshare companies like Uber, you've got absolutely every automotive company, and you've got some really brave startups trying to jump into the fray as well, basically fighting with each other, duking it out. You've got a similar air-based war with the drone companies. Um, so this is all really exciting stuff. We haven't seen that much startup activity that's relevant to the world of work, so I don't see us investing particularly he heavily there, but one of the less obvious paths to autonomous systems is what I'm calling next phase autonomous system companies, which kind of looks like it could be called a Star Trek episode. That would be kind of cool. Um, but what I'm going to share is these are companies where we've invested in a few companies that I actually could see becoming autonomous system companies down the line, but are not necessarily there yet. And so that's where I think we're going to invest more than anything else. So I'll give you one quick example. This is Thule Technologies. They put sensors in a farmer's field that tell the farmer how much to water their plants and when. And the quick lens I wanted to share about why we made that investment, because again, it kind of seems way out there, like sensors for plants, is when we talked to the farmers, the company was, had only gone through one growing season at this point. We said, okay, you know, at the very be beginning of this, how did you water your plants? And they would say, you know, we kind of had this general watering schedule, we would do it this much at this interval, and we kind of stuck to that unless we walked the fields and something seemed a little awry. And then when we put the sensor in the field, essentially the farmers started getting data back. And when they started getting data back, they were like, oh, this, this seems interesting. We'll incorporate it into our decision-making model. But then the interesting part for us was by the end of the season, the farmers had learned to trust the data, and they actually used the algorithm's recommendation as their default decision, unless they were, were aware of something like a hurricane or some major storm system that was coming in that wouldn't be accounted for. And so the, the quick point I wanted to make here is, you know, as there's more and more trust, it's not a far stretch to see that those algorithms sort of piping directly into irrigation systems to automatically do this. So next is enterprise. Oh, I gotta, I gotta hustle. So what, what we can do if you want is super interesting uh, is instead of having Q&A, we can give you time to finish this if you'd like. I would have much more fun with that. Is that okay with everybody else? Perfect. <laughs> So with enterprise, this is where everyone's been investing the longest. Again, we chatted about earlier about making big data small again. Amir alluded to this as well, or said it specifically, which is solve specific business problems, don't sell technologies. We we're completely on board with that. But the most exciting piece of enterprise machine intelligence that's been coming out has been what I call the magic wands. Sorry for the exclamation points. I was in a hipster coffee shop, and the coffee was really strong, so it won't be the last one. Um, and so the example I'm going to give you here is a company called Textio. Are you guys familiar with Textio? Um, essentially what it is, think about it this way, spell check 2.0. So you'd never send out an email without correcting the spelling errors. This understands the text from a domain specific perspective and, and allows you to optimize it. So in this case, copy paste in a job description. It's read thousands of them before. It can tell you, it will basically make your Word document a rainbow and tell you which phrases to improve why and give you a score out of 100. So within 15 minutes, you can go from, say, a 30 out of 100 quality job description to, say, a 90 out of 100. And so other than the product being cool and very accessible, the things we are really, really excited by are this company had a great data partnership strategy out of the gate. So the thing we'll hammer on over and over and over again with machine intelligence is it's more about the data than it is about the algorithms. And so they had partnerships with a lot of the Fortune 500s to basically get a bunch of job descriptions, understand time to fill, understand how good, the, how good quality the candidate was um, and what the demographics of, of, that, um, of that person were. And then they were able to use algorithms to back this all out. The other thing is they made the machine intelligence portion of this invisible. You're just using a Word document that's educating you. You don't have to worry about the algorithms. You don't have to worry about any of the technical piece. And the other thing I really liked about it is, you know, with a lot of these systems, say autopilot, for example, one of the concerns is a pilot's flying. If you take the autopilot system away, they're actually worse at doing their job because they're so reliant on it. 
This was really nice because it educates you as you go. So even if you're writing a job description and don't have access to the tool, you're in a better state, which is probably not good for society. And the last part, which is incredulous, is it actually makes writing a job description fun. And when the hell is it ever fun? So that's there. Um, I'm going to go through the platforms. Maybe we'll just kind of skip over this in the interest of time. Essentially, business models are tough. What we're seeing people doing is sell basically large seven-figure contracts to um, a couple of the folks that have a high willingness to pay sort of in a more Palantir-esque model as they wait to see sort of what the killer use cases are for their platforms. We like new data types. Um, I'm going to skip over this except to say, I know Gridspace presented here before. If you're a huge nerd and like recording your conference calls and want free insights from them, go test it out. Um, with industries, the, the one thing I will say that I love most about this is we're seeing, we, so we've got a four good category right there, which is you know, machine intelligence specifically for bettering the world independent of financial gain. But one of the most beautiful things and one of the reasons why we invest here so heavily is, I mean, if you take a look at the agriculture box, retail finance, you've got healthcare, you've got education, there's this beautiful intersection of the ability to use machine intelligence for good and, and make a lot of money and have a sustainable business. And so that's perhaps what's most exciting about the industrial space. And then with tech user tools, we're going to jump past this mostly because Dan Skolnick is the guru on this. And so <laughs> um, the, the one thing to note, though, is that open source is happening high and low, whether it's startups or big companies. And it's honestly never been a better time to integrate the free technologies that are out there. Um, so if you're a founder, think about a business problem and just use everything on here. So to quickly summarize, here are the investment lenses we talked about a little bit. Um, these are kind of the governing rules, probably about 80% of the ones we have. Freeing us up more time to be human, moving along that data-driven decision continuum. We love the invisibility of these tools when they're baked seamlessly into products. Solve an effing business problem is definitely a big one. Um, data strategy, data greater than algorithms always. Uh, and we love things that cause little to no behavioral change and employ passive data capture. So what you're normally doing is enriching the product. That creates these data network effects that Matt has, has um, described in this wonderful post he did. And uh, it will seem crazy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on one final thought. One of the things we do is we ask what if statements about the near future. The one that's been really intriguing to me, and I alluded, alluded to it when we were talking about the agents, is you know, what if I had the same support staff that a CEO has? And so, I mean, I've never aspired to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, but the thing that, the only thing I'm jealous of is they have this like incredible group of people around them that are helping with everything, whether it's editing their emails before they send them, doing speech preparation, they have analysts, they have handlers getting them to meetings on time, they have people scheduling for them. And the really exciting thing is we're seeing these agents pop up in pretty much all these spaces. So they're not going to do away with the CEO's teams, but it means that everyone in this room in five years hopefully gets these army of bots that give us the same support. And so we're interested to invest in more of that. And I'm just interested to see what the world looks like when, again, we're not distracted by all these other things when we're trying to focus on a given task. So thank you guys so much for having me. Great. Thank you so much.